So remind me, what is the norm? Do I give you time? Are you allowed enough time between classes to make it here on time so I can begin punctually, or should I delay a few minutes before I start? What's the norm? What's the cultural norm? One, two, minutes. two minutes, one minute, one minute. <laughs> very brief way. Just on the, for the sake of the students coming down from KBT or from the art school or something. When is, when is the canonical end of the previous? So we begin at, at, uh, at 2.30. When does the prior class typically end? 2.30. You guys are fit. You should be able to make it here in 10 minutes. <laughs> are, there any, are there any questions about the material? Did you guys learn something last time? Yes? I have lots of nodding. Did you learn something? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> so I'm doing my job then. All right. So last time we talked about the social construction of illness and health. And we examined this idea primarily through the lens of female reproduction. We also saw a little bit about how a natural birth movement, a natural childbirth movement, emerged in the 1980s and 1990s and how while quite understandable, the situation, in fact, is complicated in that the burden of mortality in natural circumstances can be what we would regard as unacceptably high. We saw a little bit about how our ideas about what is and is not disease can inform our responses to it, what actions we actually take, and then our further creation of knowledge and, indeed, our perceptions uh, of the world. So this was one of the big ideas of last time. It's like, we construct this reality. It's not just, oh, it's so, isn't that interesting? We're like perceiving the world in a different way. It depends on who we are. Yes, that may be true. But we then act on that. And we you know, cut people open or do things to bodies, to other people that, uh, that are contingent on this construction. Um, and, uh, and, but today, we're going to be shifting gears and talking about the experience of death and dying. And it's going to be a rather more somber session today, I'm afraid. And it's very fashionable in, um, in our political discourse, in medicine, and in public health, to speak about vulnerable populations. But it's really hard to imagine a population that's more vulnerable among us than those among us who are dying. Right? Think about right now, in this country, there are tens of thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people who are seriously ill. In any given year, about 3 million people will die. So on any given day, you can divide that by 300 or so, and you get the numbers of people that are dying today, and then all the other people that are also quite sick. So there are all these people in our midst, in this city, right now, in our hospitals, in our hospices, in our nursing homes, some of them at home, who are seriously ill and dying. And those people are truly vulnerable. Because they have nothing. They, they cannot band together and march in the streets demanding their rights. They have been disempowered politically. And I think it's not a coincidence that some of the abysmal way we care for the dying in our society, which I'll talk about in just a moment, relates in part to the fact that there's not a voting block of dying people, right? Dying people tend to have other concerns. They're not like showing up in the, in the, uh, in the voting booth to express their displeasure with the way the system is organized to care for them. So they're not able to band together to advocate effectively for their interests, nor march, and, and nor, march nor, per, nor petition their representatives. And I think that lack of political agency in part helps explain the rather dismal story I'm about to tell you today. Now first of all, let's just begin with a little bit of an understanding of the experience of dying in the United States. I was a hospice doctor for many years, taking care of people who were dying, and so this is something I saw up close for a very long time. And, uh, but most of you have not had this experience. Like most of you, probably, probably none of you, have been in the presence of someone when they died, maybe one or two of you by chance. But it's a very uncommon experience in, the, in, in 2020 uh, in, in our society. But it was a very common experience up until 100 years ago in our society. And it's still a common experience in other parts of the world. So what, what does death actually look like? Well, the typical trajectory is, is that there's some kind of onset of illness, usually in an older person. And in fact, 75% of people die after a chronic course and many uh, years of illness and treatment. That is to say, very few deaths are sudden. Usually the deaths occur 
after the person has been sick for quite a long time, they've been in the system, they've been treated, they're, they're coming to grips with their illness as is, as is their families. And then typically they enter a sort of a terminal phase of illness that typically lasts between two and 12 months leading up to their death. And this phase is typically characterized by a gradual decline. The person begins to uh, lose control of their body. They're, they get constipated or they get diarrhea. They can't move their extremities. They're weak. They lose their appetite. They lose their hair or their vision or their hearing or their ability to breathe. Many things, bodily functions, begin to slowly, slowly give way over this terminal phase that lasts between 2 to 12 months. And it, it depends on the diagnosis. And often there is pain, not always. By the end, most people have pain, as we'll see in a moment. But during this period, there's not necessarily a lot of pain. And they may have other symptoms, which typically you guys and most people don't think about, but which are actually often more distressing to the patients and more difficult to treat. For example, shortness of breath. Something like 50% of the patients in this terminal phase, phase have dyspnea, shortness of breath. And um, this is actually a really nasty symptom. If you've ever almost drowned, as I have, uh, or you know, if you've ever had your breath you know, suffocated, or you've ever had the experience of not being able to breathe, let alone if you've ever had an asthmatic attack, or you've had pneumonia, or some other experience, or you're just good at imagining the predicament of other human beings, because you're nice. <laughs> You can, you can think about this experience of shortness of breath, just a, a kind of air hunger. You just can never get enough air. This thing you're all taking for granted right now, that you can just inhale and get all the air you want. You know, people who are in this phase of illness cannot. They just want more oxygen. They want more air, and they can't get it. And it's there all the time. Many people report that that's much worse than pain. And other symptoms too, like fatigue or itching, you know, horrible itching or depression, and on and on. It's somber. It is hard to be terminally ill. And then you get to the last week of life, and typically the last week of life involves a kind of shutting down of the body. And it, it's not just a shutting down of the physical body. In my experience, caring for people like this, it's also a gradual letting go of, of the world. It's a kind of disconnection, right? They, people, they let go of their hope and expectation of continuing to be around. And they let go of their bodies. And they let go of their loved ones, right? They are slowly letting go as they are about to leave the world. And then about half the time, people typically lapse into a coma. This coma typically lasts about two days. Now we're almost at the end. Uh, so we talked about chronic illness, then the terminal phase, that's two to 12 months, then sort of the last week, now we're down to the last couple of days, and ultimately there is a cessation of bodily function. And I'll tell you it's a mystery. I have been present at the bedside where surely over 500, no, maybe not 500, but surely over 300 times I've been at the bedside when the person has died. And I, it's a mystery. You know, they're alive, and then they're dead. It's really, really weird. And I have no special explanation for what exactly happens, but the body stops. Psychologically, people go through the, you know, the classic Kubler-Ross uh, phases, which you've probably all heard about, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Uh, so patients go through a sequence of these things. First, no, I'm not sick, I'm not gonna die, and then anger, Oh my God, it's so unfair. I'm angry at God. I'm angry at the world. I'm angry at my ex-spouse who was mean to me. You know, angry. Bargaining. Oh, I'll be good. Please let me live. Very poignant. Very painful. Depression. And then acceptance. Now, this is the classic canonical description. Very famous by Kubler Ross. Over 40 years old now. But they're not always in this sequence. Not everyone goes through all the phases. It doesn't always go exactly in this order. Sometimes there's a reversal. You go forward to a step, you go back to a step. But those are features that you often see in people who are seriously ill. And in my experience, there's typically hope in all stages. And this is also a very subtle topic, which I don't think I'm going to talk to you about today, although it's something I've talked to when I, when I teach doctors how to be good hospice doctors, how to take care of people, how to cope with and reframe patients' expectations for hope uh, all of, you know, during their uh, terminal phase. 
And the dying, and I have spoken to thousands of people when they're dying, uh, have many concerns that are, as you might imagine, one of the, and they're often also very poignant, honestly. One of the concerns is that the world goes on. It's a very powerful poem or a story. I don't remember which one, but I remember having heard this more than one, maybe two or three occasions, from a patient. And then I later learned that, um, that, uh, that's, that there was a famous short story. If one of you encounters this or a poem, please send me the link, because I've lost track of that. The patients will tell the story that, that they'll see a little insect, and they'll say, tomorrow I will be dead, but this bug will still be alive. And that's kind of hard, right? You know, like, and, and, or I'm in this hospital dying, and the hospital is full of activity, and I'll be gone tomorrow, but all the other doctors and nurses will keep coming, all the other patients will have go about their business, but I won't be here anymore. That world goes on kind of feeling is a very common feeling in the dying. Another very common feeling is a deep concern about their families. We saw this on the very first lecture. We saw about the people who are committing suicide, how they are expressing this desire for connection and a concern for their families. This is very common among people who are, who are dying and, and able to speak and articulate what they're thinking. Many people express a fear of the beyond or of nothingness. Quite a few, about 20%, and this is also very poignant, will express a kind of fear of feeling alone. It's kind of lonely to be dying. And we don't make it better in our society, honestly, how we care for the dying, as I'll show you in a moment. People often describe feelings of disembodiment, a feeling of disconnection from their bodies, or anger at their bodies. You know, what a horrible body I have that's doing this to me. Or a kind of, a kind of sense of being in the grip of this powerful force what Gabriel Garcia Marquez has called the raging authority of death. In Spanish, it's so much more beautiful. There's a kind of inexorability of disease as well. And finally, there's a, a kind of a search for meaning that most people, and I would encourage you guys to have a search for meaning in, throughout your whole life, something that's difficult when you're 20 to begin to think about. But certainly as you get older, you progressively think about meaning. And surely, at the end of your life, you think about meaning. Now, alas, as we shall also see, people have very bad deaths, despite the fact that we can know so much about the trajectory to, to the end of life, and despite the fact that many of them are in medical care. Let's see first if we can get a kind of visual picture of what a dying person looks like, something that, as I said, in modern life is far removed from most people's experience. This is a woman a few years before she died, and here she is after the onset of her illness, but still more than a year away from death. You can see illness is extremely serious. Illness is very aging. It's, it's exhausting to be seriously ill. And here she is, closer to death. And I'm showing you these pictures to try to give you a feel for what the experience of death in our midst is like. And, and I recognize that this isn't easy, but it's important, I think, for you to understand what we're talking about today. And it's hard sometimes for students who are, by and large, young and healthy to get a feeling for the experience of the dying. But the dying often have a different perspective. There's one particular patient that I was extremely close to and that I got to know quite well when I was a young doctor in training. And uh, she was dying at a relatively young age. And she had tremendous equanimity about her death. She was fearless in the face of death, very rare. And I asked her, I said, how, how can you accept this? And she said to me something I haven't forgotten. She said, a dying patient needs to die like a sleepy person needs to sleep. And you can't understand this because you are young and healthy, but if you had been in my shoes, you would know what this is like. And she was able to articulate a kind of sense of letting go, which was extraordinary. This is Frank. He's dying of lung cancer at home in rural Pennsylvania. This is within one day of his death. This is a very typical appearance of someone dying of a solid tumor. Um, and he's shown here with his son and his son's wife and his newborn grandson. It's a wonderful picture, actually. And what I want you to focus on is not so much Frank's physical appearance, which is typical, 
um, of someone who's about to die of a solid tumor, but rather I want you to focus on the way Frank is embedded in his family, even while he is dying, and on the emotions of the faces of the members of his family. Look at his son, right? And his wife and the baby. I mean, this is, in, in many ways, what we, would, what we would all want, actually, at the end of our lives. In other words, people can actually manage death just fine when there's good symptom control and good professional help and support. Here's a man with a very advanced pancreatic cancer and his wife and a very large dog, and he died about six weeks after this. Notice the fun in the room, right? It's possible to actually provide care in our society that makes the situation better than the one I was describing for you earlier. And getting a feel for what a good death is and how often it is achieved in our society and what might be done to facilitate this outcome is a key focus for today. So death, as I said, is primarily a problem of the aged, though not exclusively. As I mentioned at the beginning, 75% of the people who die are far removed from you. They're 65 years or older. And then the next 10% are 55 to 64. And then on down the list so that you can get a sense of the age distribution of people when they die. And America clearly spends a lot of money caring for people when they die. This is, these are from old statistics now, but these are Medicare expenditures at the end of life. So this is everyone older than 65, almost everyone in our society has access to Medicare, so their health care is paid for. What does Medicare spend to care for people when they're dying? They spend, Medicare spends an average of $24,600 in the last year of life, and then about $9,400 in the prior year, and then $7,300 in the year before that. And the expenditures in the last year of life declined substantially with age of death. So we spend less money caring for people who are older when they fall ill. But they do not vary by race and gender in multivariate models. We do not spend differentially by race and gender in caring for people who are dying. So Americans, these are just some superficial statistics, but these and other statistics show that Americans clearly spend enough money that they are entitled to have terrific terminal care and a good death. And in fact, 25% of all healthcare spending by Medicare, and in general in our society, is spent on the last year of life. Which is not surprising. We spend a lot when people are seriously ill and near the end. Well, what do Americans want for their money? One survey of seriously ill patients from your readings found numerous attributes of a good death. But today I'm only going to focus on, and here I don't have my pointer again. Hold on. I need to improve my pointer game. I got it. I got it. Thank you. So, um, so this is a survey, and uh, and these are some attributes that of uh, uh, various samples of Americans are asked. What's important to you at the end of life? Ninety-three percent of Americans say being free of pain and other symptoms. Eighty-nine percent saying not being a burden to family. Ninety-five percent have someone who listens. People really want this when they're near death. Dying at home, only 35% said it's very important. In this survey, another study, which I'll show you in a moment, finds that the majority of Americans, greater than 70%, want to die at home, and 96% want to know what to expect. I'm going to focus on these five today, but there are others being kept clean, having your financial affairs in order, being mentally aware, have physicians to discuss your fears, being at peace with God, being able to help others. Even while they're dying, this is an important, many Americans, almost 90% of Americans say, while they're dying, it's important to them that they help others and have family present. So we'll return to some of these later in the course, but today I'm just going to focus on the top five, a kind of report card, the five key attributes about which there is generally unanimous opinion, which is being free of pain, not burdening your family, having a doctor who listens, dying at home. Uh, and knowing what to expect, that is to say, having a prognosis. If we were to assess the state of end-of-life care in our society, the richest nation on earth, and uh, which is caring for this most vulnerable population that there could be among us, those who are dying, how are we doing? Well, some of the best data we have about the dying experience in the United States comes from a very famous study known as the Support Study, which, alas, is now over 20 years old. It's the study to understand prognoses and preferences for outcomes and risks of treatments. This was a large cohort study with an embedded randomized controlled trial that tried to make things better. 
And the patients in the support study were representative of a large fraction of deaths in the United States. There were nine kinds of diseases in the people, there were about 10,000 people in the study. They had acute respiratory failure, severe congestive heart failure, non-traumatic coma, severe cirrhosis, severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, metastatic lung cancer, metastatic colon cancer, multiple organ system failure with sepsis, and multiple organ system failure with malignancy. These are all people who are very close to death. Those are all serious things, whether you, whether you recognize them or not. Those are serious conditions. And the people are near the end of their life. So the first part of the study was, how are we doing in this population? These people are all hospitalized at one of five or 10, I can't remember right now, elite hospitals in the United States. Okay, they're seriously ill, they're in the hospital, in the wealthiest nation on earth, how are they doing? Well, the great majority of patients want to be free of pain, as we saw, but unfortunately, 50% of the time, people are in severe pain, at least half the time within the last three days of life. 50% of Americans die in pain. It's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous that this is the situation we face from a policy perspective in our society. And in fact, various studies, depending on setting and definition, yield estimates that suggest that between 40 and 70% of the time, patients have very significant pain in the days before death. And this number has not changed in decades, as your reading, for example, the Singer reading that was assigned today, shows you. Moreover, 50% of the time, the patient has significant suffering while they're hospitalized. They spend a week or more in the ICU, they're in a coma, or on a ventilator. And 53% of the time, the physician did not understand that a patient wanted to avoid CPR. That's, that means the patient, if I die, I do not want to be resuscitated, but half the time that the patient had that desire, the doctors don't know that the patient has that desire, and then might attempt to resuscitate the patient, which is preposterous that the, we would do that to these people. And 70% of the time, the interviewed patients or their surrogates said that physicians did not discuss CPR during the hospitalization. Patients seriously ill, those conditions, you're gonna die, comes into the hospital, and you're not caring for them, and nobody talks to the patient about death. Hmm? No one says, how would you like us to care for you if your heart were to stop? And the answer generally should be, you know, let me die if you have metastatic tumors in that, uh, in that regard. 46% of the time, physicians did not discuss DNR orders with these seriously ill hospitalized patients until only two days before death, which in my view reflects really poor communication with such patients. You don't need to wait till the bitter end to have these conversations. In fact, it's better for the patient if you man up or woman up and talk to the patient if you're a doctor who's seriously ill about what it is that they would want. And given these and other failings in the care of the seriously ill, and given the lack of adequate attention to issues of palliative care, palliative means relief of symptoms, the support investigators designed an intervention. So they looked at the first 5,000 patients, and they said, oh my God, the situation sucks. Let's see if we can fix it. And for the next 5,000, they randomly assigned half, 2,500, to get an intervention, and other half not to get the intervention. And the intervention was trying to improve five outcomes. It wanted to enhance patient-physician agreement on CPR preferences. Let's see if we can align so the doctors know what the patients want. It wanted to enhance the incidence and timing of DNR orders. Let's see if we can make it occur earlier in the course of the illness. We wanted to reduce the days in the ICU, in a coma, or on a ventilator before death. And it wanted to enhance pain control in the patients. And finally, it wanted to say, can we do this without increasing hospital resource use. Yes, what's your name? Chase. Chase, yeah. Um, what are DNR orders? Uh, I'm sorry, do not resuscitate. Okay. Thank you for asking. So do not resuscitate orders. We're kind of lapsing into clinical conversation now. I'm sort of talking to you like your medical students, but so please ask if something's not clear from a clinical point of view. And they did a large RCT, randomized controlled trial, to see if they could make things better. And the intervention had three components. The three components of the intervention were that they developed reliable model-based prognoses and timely communication of those prognoses to the responsible physicians. This was before all the machine learning technology we have now, but they used like statistical models that were a kind of predecessor to the kind of machine learning stuff we do nowadays to say, can we look at everything that's happening to the patient, generate reliable prognostic information, hand it to the doctor, and see, does the doctor talk to the patient about their prognosis and or does the doctor act 
accordingly, given this prognostic information. They tried, the intervention tried to elicit patient and family preferences for end-of-life care and communicate those back to the physicians. So they're going to provide a, a nurse, the last component is a provision of a skilled nurse to facilitate all these interventions and discussions. So the nurse is going to get, ask the patients what they want, tell the doctor, the nurse is going to help the doctor to have enough information and communicate to the patient, and so forth. Unfortunately, the intervention did not work at all. For example, here are the results regarding the effect of the interve intervention on pain. Uh, just focus, if you will, on the right side of the panel. Um, and so what the study showed is, well, actually, we can start at the beginning. This is the perception of patients with moderate to severe pain. This is, I'm sorry, the percent of patients with moderate to severe pain. These percentages are lower than the numbers I gave you earlier because pain was defined differently here. This was measured during the second week of hospitalization, not the very end. And if you look at after the intervention, so here's the rolling period. And even in the rolling period, some people were randomized to the intervention and control group, but nothing was done to them. There's no difference in those two populations. They stop the study here while they formulate their intervention. They begin the randomized controlled trial. And as you can see, there's no difference uh, in pain levels between the intervention group and the control group in the study. And these results also show a little bit about temporal trends of pain. You know, our pain levels rising or falling in. They're pretty flat. There's nothing much going on uh, there. Um, so thus, this intensive effort to provide physicians with information and provide patients with information did not work with respect to pain. And in fact, the intervention did not improve any of the targeted outcomes. This intervention, done at huge expense at elite American hospitals, found that it did not improve communication between physicians and patients and families, did not improve physician understanding that the patient wanted to avoid CPR, did not improve the timing of DNR orders, did not reduce the number of days in the ICU, in a coma, or on a ventilator before death, did not enhance pain control, and did not measurably improve hospital resource use. Now, this was an extremely dispiriting conclusion for everybody, for, certainly for the doctors that were doing the, the researchers that were doing the study, but this this study, when it was published, had a huge impact on, uh, on American medicine because people were like, oh my god, this is our best shot to try to fix the state of affairs with our best thinking and our best people and our best hospitals, and we still weren't able to move the needle. And so the question is, will it really be so hard to improve the care of the dying in our society? Well, now, after the intervention failed, a number of commentators sort of began to uh, speculate about why. And here are some thoughts about what went wrong and about what other changes we might need to make if we're really going to improve the care of the dying. So um, it turned out even in this study, physicians did not actually get the prognostic information 41% of the time. For whatever reason, the data wasn't reaching the doctors, so they weren't able to act on it. Conversations between doctors and patients were not actually increased or improved. So even though the intervention was trying, the nurse was there, everyone is to focus, we're trying to make conversations better, they, doctors didn't actually talk to their patients. Patients may have persistent misunderstanding of their situation. I can't tell you how often this happened to me when I was a hospice doctor. So you'd be going to talk to a family about a DNR order, a do not resuscitate order, so you're asking the family, you know, you're seriously ill, you have a, you know, pancreatic cancer, and, uh, and, and many times when people are in the hospital and they're seriously ill, sometimes their heart stops beating or they have a stroke. And in that type of a situation, patients have different ideas about what they might want us to do. Some patients would like us to come in and try to resuscitate them, get their heart and their breathing to start again. And other patients would not want us to do that and, and allow them to die peacefully. What kind of patient are you? What would you prefer? That's a very compressed version of a very intimate and long conversation that I would have sitting at the patient's bedside. But what amazed me is once in a while you would talk to a patient and of course they come with these images of what you see on TV and in movies of resuscitations which are heroic and often successful. And the patients would say, you know, I want you to resuscitate me. And I said, okay, that's fine. And then you would explore with them what their thinking was. And some of the patients would think that if you resuscitated them from their heart attack, they would be restored to good health. Forgetting that they had pancreatic cancer, right? All you can hope for in that situation is to restore the patient to where they were before, which is still that they were dying from the pancreatic cancer. Do you understand? So patients are not sometimes able, they misunderstand their predicament. It's not just the 
doctors that are unable to do their part, patients too play a role in this. And physicians may actually ignore patient preferences. 50% of the time, the patients wanted to be DNR, but the doctors didn't make them DNR, which is really appalling if you think about it. I told you today it would be depressing, didn't I? <laughs> so the support study, it turns out, is not our only source of information about the care of a seriously ill, of course, and there's you know, quite a bit of research on this. And actually, the situation with respect to end-of-life care, and specifically with respect to pain relief, is so much worse in the rest of the world. This slide shows per capita consumption of morphine in 158 countries around the world. Now, leaving aside the opioid epidemic, we probably won't cover in this class, although maybe we should. Uh, just bracketing that for a moment. This shows morphine global consumption in 2012. This is milligrams per capita, milligrams of morphine use. Morphine is a very safe drug. It's an unbelievably good drug, honestly, in using it in hospital settings. So the global average is 6.28 milligrams per capita. Austria is like off the charts in its use of, of uh, morphine. And here's the United States and the UK and Ireland. Here's Greece way down over here. But this is not my point. My point is, is that in the great majority of the world, there's no morphine at all. Most human beings who die on this planet die in agony for lack of a drug that's cheap and safe and could easily be delivered. Even orally, you can deliver morphine. You don't need to inject it. So if you think the situation is bad in this country, try India, try Sub-Saharan Africa. It's so much worse. It just offends the conscience to think about. It. Now I'd, I'd like to turn, talk about pain. Let's talk about where people die and why. What determines the place of death? Is it patient preferences? Is it where the patient wants to die that guides where they die? And most people, as we saw, said that they prefer to die at home. But unfortunately, few patients are able to realize their preference, and home death is uncommon. This slide shows some changes between uh, across these three years. So in the percentage of people dying at home in 89, 97, 2007, the slight increase over this 20-year you know, uh, period, but still only 24% of people die at home. There's been some decline in hospital uh, use and increase in nursing home use in this time. The point is the minority of patients are able to die at home, even still. And in the support study, there was actually no relationship between a patient's preferences for dying at home and whether they were able to do so. So this slide shows what was the patient's preferences for dying at home. Did they very much want to die at home, quite a bit, moderately, a little bit, or not at all. Some patients do not want to die at home. Incidentally, this is ethno-racially structured in a fascinating way, and also relates to socioeconomic status. Preferences for dying at home are not uniform in our society. Nevertheless, you can ask people, do you want to die at home or not? This shows the percent of patients who are dying in the hospital. The first observation is that even people who very much want to die at home, only 57% of them are able to die. I'm sorry, only 57% of them die in the hospital. So all of these people really want to die at home, and the majority die in the hospital. That's the first point on this slide. The second point on the slide, more important in some ways, is that actually there's little relationship between your preference and whether you die in the, at home. The point is, it doesn't matter what you want. The American healthcare system is going to give you this thing, right? So you want to die at home, little, a lot, doesn't matter, one size fits all, that's what you get. You get admitted to the hospital, this is the kind of care that you get. So patient preferences for home versus hospital death did not seem to influence whether the patient died in the hospital or at home very much at all. However, one thing that does help patients die at home is hospice care. Now, hospice care, many of you might think, is a building. It's like a place you go. It's not. It's a, although it can be, it's a philosophy of care. It's a kind of clinical practice. Hospice is a mode of terminal care that emphasizes palliation and the relief of a patient's physical, emotional, and spiritual pain and suffering rather than treatment of the patient's underlying disease. Hospice care neither hastens nor delays death. It's very important. It is the active, it's not, like, it's not like, oh, you're giving up on the patient. That's total BS. It's the active total care of patients whose disease is not responsive to curative treatment. And the goal of such palliative care is the achievement of the best quality of life for patients and their families. Now, in the United States, hospice care is multidisciplinary and outpatient. In, in England, it's a primarily inpatient phenomenon. You know, there are buildings of people who go to hospices. We have that here too, but it's a minority. 
most of the time, hospice care in our society is delivered to people in their own homes. The doctors and nurses visited them. I did that for years in the south side of Chicago. I would, on Saturday afternoons, I would take my little black bag and go take care of people who were dying uh, in their homes on the south side. And it has numerous documented advantages. It's home-based. It provides for superior management of pain and non-pain symptoms. So when trials are done, randomly assigning people to hospice care or not hospice care, and then we check is the pain and, and shortness of breath better cared for in the hospital or in hospice? It's better in hospice, it's better symptom relief, and it's associated with higher patient satisfaction. And over 30% of elderly decedents use hospice care at the time of their death, and roughly 65% of cancer patients. So it's commonly used, but the problem is it's used like at the very end, like for a week or two instead of months, which it should be. And indeed, two predictors of whether a patient died at home were structural factors unrelated to the patient's agency. So again, the classic problem between structure and the sociological dilemma or, or trade-off between structure and agency, what is a patient's agency? What do they want? What does the structure give them? What constraints or opportunities do they have? And two predictors of dying in a hospital among Medicare patients, first off was hospice spending, so each additional $10 that was spent per beneficiary yielded a 2.8% decrease in hospital death. So if we, if we tool up and pay and cover hospice care, we can actually allow patients to avoid the hospital and die at home. And the second thing that affected whether you died in a hospital or not was the regional bed supply. Every extra hospital bed per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries yielded a 5% increase in hospital death. Those empty beds are like magnets. They like suck patients into them. So even though they would otherwise want or deserve or should get something else, they nevertheless wind up in the hospital. And this slide shows some geographic, this is a very famous slide taken from a very famous study uh, at Dartmouth, it's part of what's known as the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, which has been published now for 30 years. This, this slide shows geographic, so-called small area variation in the United States here, the United States is divided into 306 hospital referral regions. And we'll return to some of these geographic effects on healthcare later in the course. Today, I'm just going to show you one slide that has to do with how, what's the geographic patterning of end-of-life care in our society. So this slide shows the percent of Medicare deaths, that's people older than 65, that, uh, who die in hospitals by these regions. And the deep blue ones are 40% or more of the people die in hospitals. This excludes nursing homes. So this is not, the compliment is not people who die at home. This is just in the hospital. But nursing homes are trapped with this. And then the lighter blue colors are progressively smaller fractions of people who die in hospitals. And Mississippi is just off the charts in terms of uh, people dying in hospitals for reasons that I do not fully understand. But the reason this map is important is that it says that where you live affects the kind of healthcare you get, possibly more than your biology. Another macro theme in this course about how social factors are often more important than biological or clinical factors. Thus, if you're a patient who wants to die at home and you happen to live in an area with lots of hospital beds, you're especially unlikely to have your wishes fulfilled. And on the bright side, these results suggest something good, however. And it suggests that public policy matters and can affect what happens, both in the sense of increasing the likelihood of a particular outcome and also in the sense of increasing the ability of people to realize their objectives. When you see this type of variation from place to place, sometimes it's a description of a sorry state of affairs, but sometimes it serves in a, as an aspirational function. You can say, wait a minute, those people over there are doing it well. Let's figure out what they're doing. What policies do they have that we might copy and try to implement in our location? And this, again, is a classic example of the issue of structure versus agency. So let's look now at another aspect. We talk about pain, we talk about home death. Let's look at another aspect of a good death that I mentioned at the beginning. While 89% of patients rate not burdening family members as a key aspect of good terminal care, the majority of Americans actually have deaths which are burdensome. 55% of families experience at least one of the following effects. They needed large amounts of family caregiving. There was a major change, uh, major life change for a family member. Someone had to like quit their job to care for the person who's dying. 
The other, other family members who became sick from the stress, uh, they lost all or most of their life savings. You may not appreciate this, but something like a huge fraction of bankruptcies, I forgot how much, but 30% of American families lose all of their wealth in caring for the first person to die in the family, leaving no money for the other humans who will also inevitably die. So it's another sorry state of affairs in our society. Uh, and, or they make major changes in family planning. Overall, 55% of families have at least one of these things. So, so, so end-of-life care in our society is actually very burdensome to families, despite the fact that patients don't want it to be burdensome. Are there any questions so far? Like, I'm really, I know I'm overwhelming you, but it, it, you, can you sense that I'm passionate about this? <laughs> yes? The, the cost of what, I'm sorry? The cost of like, funerals, the cost of getting cremated, because those are no. also very expensive. Can be very expensive, although well, you can have a cremation for less than $1,000. Well, that also makes sense. Yes, yes, no, I'm not making light of that, but uh, yes, I'm, I'm, yes, but this does not include that. It does, and also, the, the costs also don't include like lost work income from family members, so you can add all that up, it's more. I think, I think we spend $100 billion per year in this country, roughly, it's more than that in direct care, like in medical care, and then there are all these other costs as well. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Stephen. Yes. Uh, I'm getting there. Your name, I'm sorry, this woman, what was your name? Jules. Jules. Stephen, yeah. Yeah, can you just quickly just go over the process of like, basically, like, Can you speak up a little bit? Oh yeah, can you just quickly go over the process of like, how, so, like, how someone would receive hospice care versus ending up in a hospital? So they would have to, either the, either the healthcare system would have to get better at saying, you know, let's tell the patient that they are a candidate for hospice care. But many doctors don't want to do that. Some people say they don't want to do it because they don't want to give up the income. Like if I'm treating you, like hospice nurses have a joke. The joke is, what is the function of nails in a coffin? It's to keep the oncologist from administering more chemotherapy. So that's, you know, so the, jo the, the joking that like the doctors have a pecuniary one, I don't actually think that's, a big factor. It is a factor. Studies show it's a factor. But like you saw, for example, with episiotomies, if the doctor is paid for the episiotomy, they do more of them. If the doctor isn't paid for the episiotomy, the rates are much lower. So money matters. So that's part of it. But I also think a lot of it is just discomfort by doctors to talk to people about their dying. And that's not a conversation you just walk in and say, you know, hi, Mr. Jones, you're dying, and then leave. Right? You need to sit down, spend some time, be vulnerable yourself, have practice doing this, it's not easy to do that. You can be trained, any one of you who goes to medical school, maybe I'll have you at some point, you can be trained to do this. So, so, so those are some of the reasons. Also, patients don't ask, you know, and I think patients and family members should ask, you know, should say, you know, doctor, we've heard about this thing called hospice care, would our loved one be a candidate for that? People who are chronically ill typically are aware, and they have to also advocate for their interests. I don't want to just blame the doctors. Okay? Patient agency is important too. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit in a moment about some of the other factors. Yes? Um, what, in medical school, what kind of training is there for having conversations with patients about this? Very little. And there's a magnificent book you should buy if you're planning on going to medical school by a man by the name of Buckman called How to Break Bad News. Actually, it's a really good book if you're breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend as well. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's, a, it's a really a useful life skill on how to break bad news. And if you're planning on going to medical school, just buy it in paperback. It's been in print forever at Johns Hopkins Press. There's also an article in The Lancet by a man by the name of Andy Billings that's much shorter. It's called How to Break Bad News. And uh, there's very little training in medical school how to do it. It's hard. Just try when you go home tonight. Sit at the mirror and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have some really bad news. You're dying. Hard. Even to say it for practice, it's hard. Really hard. But you have to do it. You have to learn how to do it. Because we're doing so bad in caring for the dying in our society. I have a lot of experience with this in my family, too, by the way, not just as a hospice doctor. Yeah? If you're a patient that you get admitted to the hospital the end of your life, but you decide that you want to go home, how easy? You can insist they cannot keep you against your will. I mean, if you're seriously in lots and lots of tubes, you have to work together with them to get into a 
a, a state where you can be taken home. If you're very rich, you can go home in tubes, you know, with all of that stuff. You can set up ventilators at home. I mean, you can do all of that stuff if you want. But, uh, you know, you have to train them, but you can insist. They can't keep you against your will. And so you can ask for a hospice consult. And let's say you're on a ventilator to keep you oxygenated, and they'll say, well, if, you, if we take you off the ventilator, you won't get enough oxygen anymore. And you can say, you know what, just give me some morphine so I won't feel short of breath. And I know my body will not be getting the oxygen it needs, and I'm dying. I want to go home. Yes, absolutely, you can do that. Other questions? Yes, what's your name? I'm sorry, I forgot the two names of you, you two. What's your name? Ellen? Ellen and Caroline. Ellen and Caroline. And what's your name? Speak up. Kelly? Kelly, yeah. Kelly. okay. Yes, there are some various rules. That's right. So, like, if 70% of doctors don't even talk to Yes. They make it, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna return to that in just the next five slides are on this topic of prognosis. So the doctors are capable of making a prognosis, but they don't talk to their patients about the prognosis. It's a different issue. So they don't, in fact, but, but they should uh, make a prognosis. And remember we, was it for this class that you read the, uh, I think it was for this class that you read that data, that data, uh, the, the, the uh, death by phenobarbital study in, uh, was it for this class session? Yes, the, 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 the like 100 cases in Oregon, the, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's another situation where you have to have the doctor make a prognosis, and the doctors were able to make a prognosis in that case, and then they got the, they got the lethal uh, drug. So as I said, finally, let's take, a, let's take a look at prognosis. This is what one patient told me a long time ago. I, this was in my first book called Death Foretold, Prophecy and Prognosis in Medical Care. The patient said to me, how long will it be, doctor? I can deal with the physical part of caring for my dad. The dad was dying of renal failure. But I just want to know. I watch him breathe, and with every breath I wonder if that would be his last. The nurse said, we can't say how long it would be. But I want to know, because it hurts me to see him like this, and I don't want to see him like this. Is he going to linger or get worse? What is going to happen? And I want to be with him as much as possible, and I want to be there when he dies. I don't want to miss that. This patient's daughter turns to the physician and has every reasonable expectation that the doctor will be willing and able to formulate an accurate prognosis. And she needs that information for a couple of reasons. First, she wants relief of her own suffering, like what's happening to my dad, you know, how long will he live? And second, she wants to make sure that she's not out at the grocery store if dad's about to die today. She doesn't want to leave the house. She has very practical utilitarian needs for the medical system to be able to provide this function. So medicine is not just about diagnosis and therapy, it's also about prognosis. Larger, more formal, quantitative studies support the salience of prognosis in patients' minds. Again and again, surveys of patients document that they rate prognosis as the number one piece of information they want from their physicians. Well, are doctors able to formulate and communicate a reliable prognosis one that both patients and doctors could then use to act upon. We conducted a prospective cohort study of prognostic error, which was uh, in your readings. And our objective was to quantify the magnitude and nature of error and evaluate some of the determinants of the error, for example, physician or patient uh, factors. And here are some of our most basic results in the study. Uh, what we did in this study is we took about 500 patients uh, who were in hospice care. We got the doctors to predict how long they would live, and then we waited to see how long the patients did live. And then we compared those two. We also did a whole bunch of other things, like elicit how confident the doctors were in their predictions, and asked them, okay, this is what you told us, what did you tell the patient? So we have the, the, the formulated prognosis, and the communicated prognosis, and the realized prognosis. This compares the realized prognosis to the formulated prognosis. On the y-axis is the observed survival, and on the x-axis is the perceived survival, and blah, blah, blah. So every one of these dots is a patient who has a real survival and a predicted survival. And as you can see, in this diagonal line is the zone of perfect prediction, the line of perfect prediction, and you can see there are not too many points on, or frankly, even near the diagonal. These are all patients that the doctor thought had months, six months to live, and they all died within a week. These are patients up here, the doctor thought would live three years, and they lived a month, okay? So doctors are way off 
in this uh, situation. If you define a zone of agreement, it's like plus or minus like 30% or something. So I predict you live four days and you live three days, or I predict you live three months and you live four months. Only 20% of the predictions are accurate. The remainder are inaccurate. And in fact, 63% of the predictions are over-optimistic. So when doctors make mistakes, they're not making mistakes at random, sometimes overestimating survival, sometimes underestimating survival. By and large, they overestimate survival in this situation. This is a huge topic. I spent five or 10 years of my life researching this. If you're actually interested in this, you can find a ton of work that the, my lab I did on this a long time ago. So in fact, moreover, we also found that this error, in general, was homo homogeneously distributed among physicians and patients. There weren't particular kinds of patients. You know, were they more optimistic with whites than blacks? Or were they you know, more pessimistic with older people than young people? Or were, you know, were, more, were, were male doctors better or worse than female doctors? None of that stuff seemed to matter, except one thing, which is what the, better the, the more the doctors knew the patients, the better the doctors knew the patients, the more likely they were to make mistakes because I think they're invested in their particular patients. And there are a number of problems that arose as a result of this inability to formulate a prognosis. Doctors would administer more painful treatments. So if you think the patient's gonna live a long time, you might say, oh, let's administer more chemotherapy or, or more surgery or more radiation. But actually, if you realize, oh my God, they're gonna die in seven days, you wouldn't make that recommendation. Or they would fail to get a DNR order because you don't anticipate the patient's going to die. Or you might refer the patient to hospice late because you don't see that they're actually sick. So you need to be trained. Doctors need to be trained to make good prognoses. And in fact, this data, data like this has prompted a, a joke that I'm told is prevalent in Spain, which is, it's better to be told you have six months to live by a doctor than by a judge. So. What about the communication of prognosis? Do physicians discuss prognosis with patients and families? And if so, in what way? We also looked at the communication of prognosis in, the, in that study that I mentioned to you. And here we look at the intended prognostic disclosure in 326 terminally ill cancer patients. Uh, these are patients who are being cared for by their own doctors. They are already in hospice care. And they are near death. Patients with their own doctors who are physically in a hospice program and who are, on average, these patients are like a week or two weeks away from death. Do doctors talk to them about their prognosis? Let's look. For 96% of the patients, the physicians were willing and able to formulate an objective prognosis and tell us. Then we asked, well, what would you tell the patient? 37% said, I'd tell the patient the same thing I would tell you. 23% said, I would refuse to tell the patient. Even though it's your own patient in the hospice that's within a week or two of death, and you've already made a prognosis and told us, they said a quarter of them said, I won't tell the patient. And 40% said, I would tell the patient something, but I tell them something different than what I told you. 70% would lie to the patient in the optimistic direction, and 30% would lie to the patient in the pessimistic direction. So 70% would say they're going to live longer than they actually thought, 30% less long than they actually thought. And this graph combines the results from the two studies, from both of our studies. It illustrates the difference between actual survival, objective survival, uh, or foreseen survival, or formulated prognosis, and subjective or foretold survival uh, in 300 terminally ill cancer patients. It's the difference between the formulated and communicated prognosis. And so this slide shows the patient survival rate, so at time zero, 100% of them are alive. This is the actual death curve. So, you know, by a, a year later, I don't know, 5 or 10% are still left alive. And then this dotted line shows the formulated prognosis, and this other dotted line shows the communicated prognosis. So the median survival is like, is I forgot what it is on the slide, it's uh, is, uh, something like, uh, median survival is 24 days. The median predicted survival, so we look at the 50% mark here, the median, uh, uh, median actual survival is 24 days. The median predicted survival, that is to say formulated what they thought, was 75 days, and the median communicated survival was 90 days. So there's a sequential series of mistakes that takes place that alienates patients from their own uh, predicament in life. And this kind of inaccurate and overly optimistic expectation that patients have can harm them, because patients take risks and make decisions that are unrealistic about treatment and their lives. So here again now, 
are the five items that the great majority of people think of as key parts of a good death. This is a report card on terminal care in the United States. So on the left are the things we saw at the beginning, what do Americans want? On the right is what can Americans have? What do they get? 93% want to be free of pain, only 30 to 50% are able to be free of pain. 89% want to not burden their family, only 45% are able to do that. 95% want a doctor who listens, only 30 to 45% of that. 70% want to die at home, only 25% die at home. 96% want to have a good, accurate prognosis told to them, only 15% are given that type of information. So the bottom line is we suck at taking care of the people in, in our society who are seriously ill. And these problems persist despite the fact that we spend roughly, as I was saying earlier, $100 billion a year caring for people in the last year of life. And here's another point, despite the fact that everyone eventually experiences this outcome. This isn't like poor kids who are getting a crappy education in rural or co counties or in urban areas of our society. So, we don't care, they're just poor kids, you know, who cares about them? Everyone is going to die, right? We all have an interest in improving the care of the dying in our society. So we can conclude that the quality of death in America is poor. This poor quality varies in discernible ways, although it's pretty uniformly bad, and improving care of the dying will not be easy. Now, end-of-life care is office, often seen as so bad that people have advocated for and hospitals have begun to implement various kinds of death with dignity programs in several states, allowing doctors to prescribe a lethal dose of barbiturates for self-administration by patients that meet rather stringent criteria. And this slide shows various attributes of patients participating in one death with dignity program at the Hutchison Cancer Center in Seattle, one of the most illustrious programs in our country, compared to groups from Washington State and Oregon more generally, and was taken, this slide was taken from your reading. Unsurprisingly, these patients have the same primary concerns about their end-of-life care and experiences as we saw with everyone else. So if you look at what are these people concerned about, why they participate in the program, loss of autonomy, loss of dignity, loss of control of body function, burden of their family, which are all the things that we've seen that people are concerned about. And so you can see that these patients care, concerned about these things, seek out this opportunity to end their own lives in a medically assisted way. So what can be done to improve the, star, the, sorry, the sorry state of end of life care in our society? Well, in my opinion, we, a bunch of things. We can enhance communication between patients and doctors. So the support study failed, but it doesn't mean it wouldn't work if we could actually do it. And we can even create activated patients. They're, 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 the procedures you can do to educate patients to advocate for their own interests or improve medical education, as we've been discussing. You can, we can investigate the optimal nature and timing of transitions between care systems. How can we move people through the system better? We can evaluate the role of the specialty of palliative care. Maybe we need to train more doctors with these skills. We can develop the science of prognostication and we can design systems of care that address patient preferences. For example, as we saw the hospice spending uh, idea or this notion of pain as a fifth vital sign. So the, the four vital signs are heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and respiratory rate. Let's add a fifth vital sign, which has been done now. So every time you go into a patient's room, you assess their pain on a scale of one to 10. So this becomes something that people track and therefore might uh, res uh, respond to. Or we could use some of the principles of harm reduction that we'll discuss in the next lecture that might be quite relevant also to end-of-life care. Well, what, what might be done about this rampant prognostic error that I uh, described to you? There are several possible ways to enhance the prognostic accuracy of physicians and so perhaps optimize the choices that they make with respect to the care that they give patients at the end of their lives. And these include a number of ideas. Here are four techniques for enhancing prognostic accuracy. One idea is to elicit prognoses from a dispassionate physician, like get a second opinion about the prognosis, not the doctor who, who's invested in the care, either personally or financially. We can elicit prognosis in terms of probability rather than time. Turns out if you ask doctors how long will this patient live in units denominated in time, they don't like to answer that question. But if you ask them, what's the probability this patient will live a year, they'll say, oh, 15%. Or what's the problem this patient will live 30 days? Oh, 5%. So 
they're willing to answer probability-based questions. So if we reframe how we elicit the information, we can improve the performance. And we did some research in my lab years ago showing that's the case. We can supplement physicians' estimates with machine learning models. This is a very active area of research right now in our country. Or we can average prognostic estimates across uh, physicians. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Suppose that you get a doctor, so the question is, are two heads better than one? Suppose that you get a doctor to make a prediction. And the question is, is it more accurate if you get several doctors to do so and then average their predictions? And the answer is, yes, it is. And this has something to do with what's called signal-to-noise theory. Let me see if I can illustrate this idea for you very briefly. And I'm going to do it with a digression. Suppose we wanted to extract the changes that are induced in cerebral activity by a visual stimulus. So for example, we put electrodes over your occipital cortex, you know, where the visual part of the brain is, and then we flash bright lights in your eyes, and we time the flash and then re make recordings from your occipital cortex, and the amount of recording looks like that. So the stimulus is in orange here, bang, you flash light, and here's what happens afterwards in the visual cortex when we read the electrical signals using uh, the EEG. Well, the next figure is a simulation of this process because what you typically would do is, is you would flash and record, flash and record, flash and record, and, uh, and so you give your subjects a lot of stimuli, and the basal activity, so what's happening here is there's some baseline level of noise in the system. Your brain is just firing, and buried in that noise is the actual signal. So what you do is, is, is you give multiple, multiple signals. So you, you record many recordings of the, the response, the occipital cortex EEG signal based on the uh, after the stimulus. And then you average all those. And when you average all those, you can see the signal. And the reason is, some of you who study engineering will of course know this, but the reason is the noise is random. Any given second, if something is due to noise, it might be up or down. You know, like for example, here there might be some noise. In this particular instance, this curve is going up, but this other curve here, in this particular instance, is going down because it's noise. There's no meaning to it. But the signal is real. It's there in all of the images. So when you average all these signals, the up and down thing, random noise, cancel each other out, but the signal is enhanced. And so now you can actually see the signal in the noise. So averaging doctors' prognoses can increase the accuracy of their prognosis. And, and this has been tried, and it works. Uh, so I was going to make a little bit I'm going to run out of time for my digressions. Um, OK, so there are two final topics I wanted to discuss today. One topic is this question of who should speak for patients at the end of life. And many or most patients often cannot decide for themselves. And this is ethically patterned, as we saw a few lectures ago. Uh, they can't decide for themselves what should happen at the end of their lives. And sometimes it's because they're unconscious. And the question is, who should decide in such circumstances? Should it be the doctor? Should it be the family? Or should it be the patient at an earlier point in time? And as we saw, 50% of patients are in no shape at the end of life to make their wishes known. And as we also saw, 53% have physicians who are unaware of their preferences regarding CPR. So how are we going to fix this? How are we going to solve this problem? Well, substituted judgment has been proposed as a method for promoting the autonomy of mentally incapacitated patients. But the accuracy of surrogate decision makers in reflecting the true wishes of patients may be questionable. And in this study, 17 currently competent but chronically ill elderly patients were paired with close family members and their primary care provider. So we have triplets, patient, close family member that they identified as a surrogate, and the patient's doctor. And the wishes of the patients were compared to these possible surrogates. The patients were queried regarding the hypothetical CPR scenario under circumstances of current health and progressive dementia. And most patient respondents chose to be resuscitated under both scenarios. So when people are asked, what would you want done if you're sick as you are now or if you have progressive dementia, most of them said they would like to be resuscitated. And most patients predicted that both their physicians, 90% of the time, and their family members, 87% of the time, would accurately represent their wishes. But in fact, neither type of surrogate was able to do so. 
and the percent agreement ranged from 59 to 88 percent. So we asked the patients, okay, your current health status, would you like to get CPR or would you like to be DNR? So we asked the patients that, and so 47 plus 14 of the patients wanted CPR, and 5 plus 3, 8 of them wanted to be DNR, do not resuscitate. And we do a little two by two table, because we go to the doctor and we say, what would this patient want in this situation? And the doctors have a very different opinion about what's to happen. And it's much more likely to be off diagonal elements. So this diagonal is where the doctor and the patient agree, and this diagonal is where they disagree. And in 14 of the cases, the doctor thought the patient wanted to be DNR, but the patient didn't want CPR. And in five patients, it was the opposite. The patient said, do not resuscitate me. And the doctor said, oh no, I want CPR. The patient wants CPR. And here you can look at family circuits, and you get no better performance. Similar type of bias. And actually, in some ways, you get more patients off the diagonal, 17 plus 11, rather than 14 plus 5. In fact, physicians did no better than chance alone. And physicians also tended to want to withhold care more. As I said, they were above the diagonal rather than below it. And family surrogates did somewhat better, but they were still far from perfect, uh, especially, in, um, especially in, um, in the forecasted state of serious illness. So this is the same study now looking at family surrogates, and the, and the families were a little bit better, but they also had errors. For example, if you look here in the dementia scenario, quite a number of the family surrogates did not know what the people wanted. And, then, and as it turned out, few patients had ever discussed their preferences uh, with their family member or their doctors in this study. So when they said, well, did you actually ever talk to anyone? The answer from the patients was no, I did not. Well, if doctors, and, uh, if doctors and patients are lousy surrogates or lousy proxies, how about the patient themselves as a proxy? Who, who knows what this is? Who's taken English 130? Raise your hands. I took English 130 at Yale. Anyway, you read the Odyssey when you take English 130 at Yale. This is Odysseus tied to the mast. Anyone, raise your hands if you know the story. Well, hop high so I can see if you know the story. Okay, so half of you don't know. I'll tell you really quickly the story. <laughs> Odysseus, Athena comes to Odysseus and she says to him, you and your men are going to sail by the island of the Sirens that are beautiful women, you know, and, uh, and, and the sailors had been on, on their void. They'd been 10 years at war in Troy, 10 years sailing home, and they were going to be seduced by these women who sang beautifully. But these women, it turns out, were actually Sirens. They were, they were evildoers. They would lure the men onto the shore and the ship would crash and uh, they would all die. So Athena comes to Odysseus and she says, you know, be careful when you sail by that island, plug your ears with wax. And Odysseus, because he was smart, he said, well, you know, I would like to hear the song of the sirens, which is so hauntingly beautiful, but not die. So he tells his men, tie me to the mast. You guys plug your ears with wax, and no matter what I say, no matter what I say as we go past the island, do not release me, just tighten the ropes when I ask you to do stuff. And as as he's going past the him, he's, he desperately wants to go home. And the sirens are singing about Penelope and Telemachus. They're singing about his home. They're just seducing him with like a good life. And he desperately is telling the men, row to the shore, row to the shore. And I change my mind, Odysseus says. I don't want, ignore what I told you before. Do what I'm telling you now. And the, siren, and the men said, no, his sailor, his, uh, his, uh, the man on his crew tied him stronger. So Odysseus is the only man that heard the siren song and did not die. So that's, this is known as an Odysseus contract. Can you bind your future self? Can you say, this is what I want you to do if I'm at the end of life, and no matter what I say then, ignore it. This is very difficult, right? Because what are you going to do if the patient says to you, you know, I changed my mind, don't do what I told you earlier. And, uh, and, and, alas, and, and alas, it is possible that people's own preferences are not stable or consistent. And in fact, the test retest reliability of people's preferences is no better than that of patients and proxies. In other words, we can't use doctors, we can't use family members, and we can't even use your prior self to predict what you're going to want in the future. But there's actually a more general theoretical problem here, and that is the relationship between your present self and your future self. Is your present self actually an accurate forecaster of your future self? And people in different states assign different utilities, remember we talked about utilities a few lectures ago, to those states. And a person with two arms may think it is a worse handicap to have just one arm than a person with one arm did. Remember I told you that story. 
So, so how can we know how you would feel about being in a future state in which you had, let's say, only one arm? The idea of binding one's future self is known as an Odysseus contract, and the modern end-of-life equivalent is known as an advanced directive, when you pick what you want done in the future. But it turns out that people do not appear to estimate how they would find possible states they might find themselves in the future reliably. So for example, people are asked, how bad would it be to be on dialysis? Remember we talked about a dialysis three times a week. You have to go to a place, you sit for three or four hours in a chair, you're connected to these tubes, blood is taken out of your body, it's cleaned and put back into your body. Non-patients think, that'd be terrible. And my utility measured in the ways we discussed a few lectures ago, of dialysis would be 0 0.39. But patients say it's not so bad. I'm on dialysis and I'm telling you actually it's not so bad. So if we asked you, how much would you wish to avoid dialysis in the future? What should we do? You might say, oh, I want you to do this. But then when you get into that state, you're like, you know, actually I changed my mind. Now I have that state. It doesn't feel so bad. Or if you look at something called a colostomy. A colostomy is when there's, a, let's say you remove part of a person's colon, you bring up a loop of bowel to the body wall, you, you make a hole in the body wall, and you anastomose the, the colon to the body wall, and you put a bag there, so people poop through a hole in their abdomen into a bag. This bag accumulates all the, the poop, and then you have to clean it, you know, once a day or whatever. You describe it to you, you might think, oh, that's awful. So your colostomy is, you know, your utility your, uh, is 0 0.8, as we discussed earlier. But actually, patients with colostomies don't like it so much. They say, yeah, it sucks to have a colostomy, but it's, it's not so bad. And, um, and there are many possible explanations for these discrepancies that have been explored by Peter Hubel and other psychologists. And these include things like measurement problems, like we don't, we're not accurately describing the state. Uh, so if you describe it better, we would get better forecasting by people. Or framing effects, depending on who is asking the question or for what purpose. Or a lack of respondent integration across time of health states, so they don't really think clearly about chronically being in that state. Or something, or certain cognitive biases, such as something known as a focusing illusion where people, uh, court, people focus on only certain aspects of the health states and forget everything else. So in the philosophy, then you're like focusing on, oh, I've had to be awful to this bag of poop on my abdomen, and, and you're just thinking about that right now, and you're like, oh, that sucks, that sucks. And you don't think, you know, actually, the rest of my life would be fine. I could listen to music, I could have sex, I could go about my business, I could work. Most of my life is okay. So actually, it's not so bad to have a philosophy. Just when I focus your attention on it, it sounds really bad. Uh, there's a problem of response shift, that is to say a, a 10 to an 80 year old is different than a 10 to a 20 year old in terms of how bad things are. And most interestingly, there's this issue of adaptation, which is a kind of general property of our nervous system, such that we get used to uh, things. Our nervous system is designed to detect change. So this morning, when you put on your socks, who, how many of you felt it when you put your socks on? You feel your who did not feel their socks going on this morning? Anyone did not feel their socks? Okay. Okay, who is not aware of their socks right now until I drew attention to your socks? You weren't thinking about your socks a moment ago, were you? So this morning, when you put on your socks, you felt them go on your feet, and then the rest of the day, you're not aware of your socks being on your feet. Why is that? Because our nervous system is wired to detect change. Once your socks are on and they're stable, you no longer are detecting that. You think you're miserable and you'll be miserable for the rest of your life. But actually, that's not true. Eventually, you recover, you adapt, and then even sometimes you think, you know, good riddance and after the problem. Um, so, so anyway, so you and or there can be reductions in your expectations. You no longer care about taking long walks in the woods. Before, when I asked you how bad would it be to not be able to take walks, you think it was great, it would be awful. Mm -hmm. Now you don't mind it anymore. Or people with arthritis stop playing the piano and start singing or whatever. And these cases of substituted judgment which we've been considering, typically emerge in these states worse than death, which we saw earlier when we talked about patients' utilities, all of these awful states that people might be in. The way the healthcare system treats a vulnerable, terminally ill patient is instrumental to whether a patient ultimately has a dignified death. And this is the last thing I'm going to tell you today. And this is related to the classic argument that was advanced by psychologist B.F. Skinner, Skinner in a famous book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And Skinner argues that dignity is not an inherent attribute of individuals originating within them, but rather that dignity is a product of their physical and social environment, at least in his view. 
And this may actually be contrasted with other thinkers like Viktor Frankl, who think you could have dignity even while you're in Auschwitz, right? Frankl is in Auschwitz, but he has great dignity despite the undignified way he's being treated. Skinner believes that the causes of dignity are external to the individual. And this is again a dilemma between structure versus agency. Indignity, he argues, originates in the treatment of one person by others. And conversely, and just as assuredly, dignity can depend upon the treatment of one person by others. While this is a general observation, in my view, this is especially the case at the end of life. Because if we're serious about dignity, we should revise the way we care for the dying, not only for the sake of patients, but also for the sake of doctors. Because in my view, it's undignified for the doctor and for our society to be providing such undignified care. Okay, see you next time.